Hey everybody, it's Mr. Herzl. Uh, you've been directed to this page either as a first resource to learn about the material or as a review. Either way, I'm going to help you guys understand the French and Indian War, or some people call it the Seven Years' War, or people call it the Great War of the Empire. There's a bunch of names and it's kind of confusing, but I'm going to help you work through it. So the Teaks uh, that the state of Texas wants you to know, they want you to know the causes of the American Revolution. The reason why it's important to study the French Revolution is because it is a big issue that is going to be that's going to be a cause of the American Revolution. So when people say, well, "Why did the American Revolution happen?" they're going to look at this and they're going to say, "Oh, well, the French and Indian War helped to cause that." Uh, 8.14a, explain why a free enterprise system of economics developed in the new nation, including minimal government, intrusion, taxation, and property rights. Um, so again, this is all going to be tied into the French and Indian War, um, and we'll talk about that later. And the last one, analyze the leadership qualities of elected and appointed leaders in the United States, such as George Washington. This is going to be the first time we hear about George, and so uh, you can look forward to that. All right, let's get started. Okay, so by 1750, British and French, uh, they'd become serious rivals, and they'd become serious rivals multiple different, in multiple different wars. If you want to know how much the French and the British hated each other, I mean, you can go back and look at the beginning of uh, their existence. I mean, when they became countries in the, in the very beginning, they were at war with each other ever since that time. Uh, if you look at where they're at, and I'm bringing up my pointer, um, if you look at where they're at, you know, they're right next to each other, so they're constantly battling each other. Uh, another thing that's interesting about that is it causes a need for navies because obviously they're not connected um, by land. So they need great navies, and that's how you get these naval battles between France and Great Britain. But anyway, all you need to know is they hated each other, and they'd been fighting each other from, you know, I mean, just after Roman times when Europe is first... Um, kind of moved into by Germanic tribes and all that stuff. You don't need to know any of that. Just know that the British and the French hated each other. <laughs> uh, they really didn't like each other. So uh, at this point in time, they both started to use mercantilism to expand their colonies' um, claim. So what is mercantilism? Well, we talked about that last time. It's basically anytime a country is trying to have a fair balance of trade, so it's real easy to understand if you think about, um, like let's say in this, like today, uh, where do you get most of your clothes from? If you looked at the tag on your shirt or on your pants or your shoes, like where do most of your clothes come from? And the answer is probably going to be like China. So uh, what is our balance of trade with China? Well, do you know, the question is do we get more things from China here? You know, do we take more things that they make? Uh, do we buy more of what they make? Or do we sell more of what we make to them? Like what what's coming over more? More of their stuff to us or more of our stuff in the United States to them? And the answer is we have a lot more of their stuff uh, for sale over here than they have of ours. And so we have a um, unfavorable balance of trade. Like we spend more money and send more money to China because we're buying their stuff than they're sending money our way. We're not, they're not buying very much of our stuff. And if that's confusing, I'll just put it like this. Um, if a country is selling more than they're buying uh, from any other country, then that's a good thing. Why? Because if they're selling things, that means that other company is buying things from them and there's money. Like if Great Britain has tobacco and they're like, hey, we're going to sell tobacco to Portugal or something. Um, and so they're selling like a ton of uh, tobacco to Portugal. Well, Portugal's buying that tobacco and they're giving money back to Great Britain. And so Great Britain is just collecting all that money. Now, you could have it the other way where Portugal is selling to Great Britain, but Great Britain would rather be selling to other countries because they get to keep all the money. 
So that can be kind of confusing, but hopefully you can understand that. If you don't, you can ask your teacher to explain it one more time, and they'll probably be glad to do that with um, a, a current day example. But anyway, mercantilism is where they want all of the gold. And so one of the ways that they do that is they use uh, colonies. So like down here in South America, Spain is going to use that to get gold, right? So they're shipping all this gold back to Spain, and they become one of the most powerful countries in the world. But later on, uh, you know, they're not as powerful. And so it gives Great Britain and France an opportunity to gain a lot of wealth through other colonies, right? And so Great Britain is obviously here in the colonies, and they're trying to, uh, you know, gain a great deal of wealth from uh, having a lot of um, <coughs> a lot of tobacco sold from here and, and a lot of other things. And then France, of course, if we look over here, in the uh, Mississippi River area and up into Canada, they are trading in furs. And so there's no doubt that at some point in time, because these two nations hate each other, their colonies are going to come into conflict, right? Like they're, they're not going to live peacefully together. They're, uh, they're going to fight each other eventually. All right, so they're going to go to war multiple times uh, from 1690 to 1750. And before that, they'd been at war like forever. Right? And what does that mean for the colonists? It meant that the colonists had to fight too. So if you're a British colony, you're going to have to fight with England. England, Britain is the same thing, remember. So... Sorry about that. There was a glitch in the recording. But what I was saying was if you're a colonist for England, England, Great Britain is the same thing. And if you're one of their colonists here in the 13 colonies and there's a war you're gonna to have to fight on their side, especially if it's over here in North America. If you're a French colonist, you're gonna to have to fight on the French side. So it involves, it involves During the During the 1700s, both the British and the French colonies were growing. So obviously they are, we've already talked about the English colonies, um, Britain and England, same thing. The, their colonies are growing and we've already talked about them. But you know, at the beginning we talked about the French colonies uh, a little bit uh, but they are also growing as well. So remember the French are trading in furs and so they're expanding quite a bit during that time as well. So we've been learning about the expansion of these colonies but all that time France has been expanding as well. Land disputes along the Ohio River Valley led to the French and Indian War. So here's what this is all about. So this area, the 13 colonies, what you have is a lot of uh, really wealthy individuals or people who had been established there for a while are going to be living at that point in time at uh, the uh, near to the east coast. Okay, so all of the land that is already established, you know, um, is there. And what you have is you have all the poorer people that want to, you know, they don't have a plantation. They're just, they're brand new there, or maybe they were an indentured servant, um, or there's a lot of possibilities, but maybe they're a new immigrant and they don't have any land. And so all of the, these places are established now and they've got, you know, plantations through them and business through them. And so where are they going to go? Well, they're going to expand west. We're going to all like from now on in this course, we're going to push west. Everybody's going to be pushing west. Um, for new land and so that brings them into conflict with the people that own that land who are originally the Native Americans but then also the European power the French who had colonized that area so this is going to be a conflict they're going to uh, they're not going to like that these English people are moving into their land And the growth of the British and the French colonies impacted Indians too. So Native Americans are going to not like the fact that all of these English are pushing into their area. And again, who's more friendly with the French? Well, or I mean, who's more friendly with the Native Americans? Well, the French are because they have trade networks set up. That doesn't mean that all the Indians hated the English. That's actually not true. Um, this was all about, remember, originally the Native Americans are all fighting each other. So tribes are fighting each other. And so this is an opportunity for the tribes to team up with a European power. Because Europeans have access to things like steel and guns uh, and all, all kinds of things that help them in warfare. 
And so you got to pick a side. Whose side are you going to be on? Are you going to be on English side, England side, or are you going to be on the French side? And a lot of those Native Americans in this area pick the French, but there are other Native Americans who pick the English. Spread a colonist into the backcountry and across the Appalachian Mountains. So if we look at the Appalachian Mountains, okay, they're going to be right into this area here, okay. Um, and so, like, you can see kind of the topography here, right? So um, it leads to a lot of conflicts. And, and when we talk about the, the frontier at this point in time, it's right along this line where the Appalachian Mountains are. All right, so again, you know, Native Americans who their entire life have gone uh, and had this vast amount of area to move around in and who have fought for control of those territories. You know, they fought very hard against other tribes for control of their territory. Now all of a sudden they're seeing English settlements, British settlements um, come into their land. And I'm going to say this 15, you know, 20 times. England and Britain are the same thing. Uh, but they're seeing those British settlements pop up and all of a sudden it worries them. And so many of them are going to fight for... Uh, to get them out of that land. So in 1754, the colonists from across the British colonies are going to meet together at uh, what we call the Albany Congress. And what they're going to try to do is, at this time, there were 13 separate colonies. So the, those 13 separate colonies were not one nation. They were not considered one group um, under English control. They were all separate, and they all had separate agreements with England. They all had everything was separate, uh, according to each colony. And so, uh, because of that, they didn't have one. They couldn't come together and fight a common enemy like the French. And they knew that these problems were coming with the French and the Indians. But you know, they knew that, uh, the, and they, so they knew that they had to join together. They wanted to join together and try to be able to fight together against the French. So Benjamin Franklin's going to propose the Albany Plan of Union, which means that they would come together, and that's how you get this. You know, it's pretty famous, join or die. Uh, you got to come together. Like, if we don't fight together, then we're going to die separate. Uh, but at this point in time, the plan wasn't approved. So the colonies lacked the unity to solve any kind of common problem. And this is something that we're going to see already. We're going to see a divide between the different different colonies and the interests that each colony has. All right, so a turning point in 1754. In 1754, the Virginia governor is going to send George Washington, 22 years old, to protect an Ohio company claim. So here's what had happened. Um, the English had claimed this Ohio Company of Virginia that you see here. So they had claimed this area, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were there. Nobody was really there. It was backcountry. But they had said, well, we went and at some point explored it, and that's ours. Um, and so it's kind of like what the early explorers did when they, you know, they'd get in a boat and they'd go up and down the coast and they'd say, oh, I see that land. It's mine, or I'm claiming it for the king. Well, they didn't really go and settle there yet. Um, and so it's kind of the same thing. Like the Ohio Company of Virginia hadn't gone and settled there yet, um, but they had made the claim. And they wanted to defend the claim because they knew that expanding west was the future of uh, you know their prosperity and them being able to develop more land for growing things and selling them. It was also really important for trade as well. So they send George Washington to George Washington to the claim. And so Washington's troops uh, basically they got in a battle, an original battle, and they they did well at first. So they route it was only they got in a conflict with like thirty British or I mean thirty French. Sorry, Washington's British at this time. So they got in a conflict with thirty um, French and they basically made them surrender and then they were worried about a counterattack and so they built this fort and it was called Fort Necessity um, and they stayed there. Well, the French didn't like that. 
because it was in their territory. And so um, the French basically surrounded it and killed a bunch of Washington's troops. And then they told Washington, hey, if we'll let you go if you promise and everybody in your – we'll let you and everybody who's still alive and you know, your fort necessity, we'll let you go. But you have to promise to stay out of um, this territory for the next year. And so he did that, and he went home defeated and uh, basically never got uh, Fort De King. So, But Fort De King is important because um, – Fort De King is important because it sits here. If you've ever been to Pittsburgh, you will see there's a big hill over here in Pittsburgh, and you can go up like a trolley line uh, that goes up here up the hill and you can kind of overlook this and there's Heinz Field where if you ever watch the Steelers play that's where they play um, and then there's the the Pirates play over here as well and so but there's a, a river that goes right through here right so there's and it splits and this is downtown Pittsburgh today well Fort De King was right here and so anybody who had the you know had control of this fort even though it was a small fort it wasn't built very well but anyone who had control over it could basically just fire at any ships that came down here and they could control all of the trade uh, you know that that came down those rivers and so it was really important um, the, the English kept trying to take it over and over again and the French used it to defeat the British multiple times. So George Washington never takes it. Um, he never gets control of it, and he goes home defeated. So George Washington, this person we think of as, you know, or is the founder of our country, basically, um, uh, he actually was defeated in the first battle that he was ever in. You know, George Washington's not only famous for being the first president, but he's famous for being the lead general in charge of the uh you know the american revolution and in this great general his first outing is a defeat against the french so that's pretty interesting all right so the french and indian war is the french and the indians are joining together to fight the british don't think that the french are fighting the indians okay the french and the indians are joining together to fight the British, all right? So the war starts in North America, but it became a part of a larger war. So I told you there were multiple names for this war, and the most common is either the Seven Years' War. Um, well, there, there's just multiple ones. There's the War of, of Empire, the Great War of the Empire. There's a lot of different ones. French and Indian War, lots of different names, okay? But when you hear either French and Indian War or Seven Years' War, you're going to know that that has to do with this, okay? Now, the larger war was called the Seven... It was called the Seven Years' War or uh, Great War of the Empire. The war that was taking place, the smaller portion of the war that was taking place over here is called the French and Indian War because the French and the Indians were fighting against the British. So if that makes sense to you, um, that's, that's why it has those multiple names because it was fought all over the world. So here's a battle scene from the French and Indian War. Um, yeah, so the British were losing during the early years of the war. And there were two different uh, schools of thought on this. Um, basically, you had two different schools of thought in England about the war. Okay, Multiple people thought that they should just kind of abandon the war and they should focus all of their energy on, across the Atlantic Ocean on their own country. So, hey, pull all of the resources, all of the money back and protect England and build up England – um, and then protect her, the motherland. There was another school of thought, uh, a philosophy, whatever you want to call it. There were another group of people that thought that the best thing to do for England's future was to build up the, um, the navy and also fight 
as hard and as you know as violently as they could against the French overseas. Okay, so a guy in 1757 named William Pitt comes into power, and he believes in the second option. So instead of saying, "Hey, we're going to pull all of our all of our men, boats, everything back to England," he's the guy on the other side that says, "No, the best thing for England's future is to send all of our ships and all of our resources um, that we can over to our colonies and fight there and beat the French." Okay, so William Pitt is going to issue basically a blank check to win the war. He says, whatever you guys need, you can use to win the war. So the turning point in the war was the Battle of Quebec. And basically, you know, what happens is they keep fighting them. Uh, the colonists basically come into Canada, what we know now as Canada, and they knew then as New France, and just push them all the way back. Boom, 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 until they're defeated. Sorry, that's my golden retriever. I'm recording this at home. Um, so they push them back, 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 back until they get to Quebec and take Quebec. So the war is going to officially end with the Treaty of Paris in 1763. Okay, France is going to lose Canada, most of its empire in India, because remember this war was across the whole world. Um, and and they're gonna they're going to um, France is gonna lose their claims to the lands east of the Mississippi River. So basically, everywhere that the French were, they're gonna lose control of. So now England basically controls everything, but Spain is still here. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, so England's going to gain all the French lands. Um, and they're going to have exclusive rights, which means they're the only people who have any kind of trade with uh, the Caribbean and the Caribbean slave trade. So this is very important as well to American history. So how you know we we talk about how does the slave trade ramp up, or like how does it start? Because remember, in England, England and France, there were no slaves. There were no slaves in Europe uh, ever. Uh, um, in a any kind of substantive way, I'm sure there were some somewhere, but uh, England and France didn't have slaves, and so how do how does the how do the colonies build this massive slave trade, uh, or how do they become a part of? But it could probably be better said, how do they become a part of the massive slave trade that was happening um, south of them? And so this is how they gain control of. Well, this is one more way how they gain control of. Um, the Caribbean after the French and Indian War. And the Caribbean was already, they'd been using slaves for, you know, 100 years before this, um, probably even more than that, uh, through Portugal and Spain's uh, efforts there. All right, Spain got all the lands west of the Mississippi River, uh, New Orleans, but lost Florida to England. Now, later on, we're going to talk about this again, and Spain wasn't supposed to. Be, they weren't supposed to do anything or give any of this land back to France, but they end up doing it, so it's kind of complicated. But for now, Spain will own this. All right, so the French and Indian War changed the relationship between Britain and the American colonists. And why did it change the relationship between them? This is going to be one of the reasons why we talk about... Um, the importance of the French and Indian War uh, and how it caused, it was one of the causes of the American Revolution. If you look at this, this is very close. We're getting closer to the American Revolution, the date of the American Revolution. And so we got to ask, hey, what did, uh, how did the French and Indian War affect um, the, you know, the causes of the American Revolution? So the colonists are excited about the possibility of new land in the West uh, now that the French were gone. So they say, all right, we finally did it. We got rid of the French. We shouldn't have this issue anymore. We don't have them occupying all this land over here. Like, this is all ours. We should be able to push as far as we want in here. And all these poor people and, you know, 
it, it amps up a lot of people. Remember, most of the people in this area are poor farmers and they think, wow, I can move out west and have all of this land and I could be like you know, the rich plantation owner that I know down the road. I could be that guy. It's the American dream before there was an America. It's the colonial dream at this point. And so they're like, hey, yes, we get to push to new land, new unclaimed land. Uh, but the problem was is that maybe the French were gone, but the Indians who fought with them were not. And so the Indians are going to fight against the uh, colonist. All right, so one of the big problems that causes is a cause of the American Revolution is this. William Pitt had spent a lot of money on the French and Indian War. Remember that blank check that he wrote? Well, that was a lot of money. And so now Parliament, who's in charge, they're like the government who's in charge of England. They say, England says basically, we want our money back. We need, you know, we spent all this money to beat the French over there, and now we want to be paid back. Okay? We want something for our money. We want a return on our investment. Um, and so we want to be paid back for all that money we spent. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, the reason, the way that they're going to do that is they're going to start to become stricter about uh, taxes and control over the colonies and all kinds of things like that. Another problem is it strained the relationship between Britain and the colonists after the war, which was, you know, um, the British army wasn't removed from America. So it wasn't like they were here and then they left. You know, that's not what happened. Uh, they stayed there. They stayed there for a long time, and the colonists were like, why do we still have British troops here? We shouldn't have British troops here anymore. The British troops are trying to control them, uh, and they didn't, they didn't like that. All right, the uh, Ottawa Indians, led by Chief Pontiac, attacked the frontier settlers who flooded into the Ohio Valley. So um, we talked about those Native Americans who, yeah, the French had left, but the Native Americans who hated the settlers were still there. And so um, Chief Pontiac is going to bring together multiple different tribes, and you get Pontiac's Rebellion, uh, and that's a big problem. So basically the Native Americans are coming in, and they are fighting the British settlers for control of those areas. All right, Pontiac's War, here's a map of it. Um, not really important that you know all about it, but just know that Pontiac basically brought all these tribes together and fought the British. And then the British are going to go after Pontiac as well and shut him down. Okay, Britain had to spend more money defending the colonists in the frontier. So again, Britain has already spent all of this money and now they're spending all, all this more money on defending the frontier against the Native Americans in the Pon in Pontiac's Rebellion. Okay, so there's a proclamation of 1763 that comes after Pontiac's Rebellion. And basically what it does is it says, okay, to make peace with the Native Americans, the, we will not let our colonists move anywhere across the Appalachian Mountains. So colonists had, could not move anywhere this way, over here. So this is the Appalachian Mountains where my pointer is, okay, like this area here. And it's saying nobody can move across the mountains. Now what do you think that the colonists are going to think about that? All of those individuals who thought, hey, the French are gone, so now we get to do whatever we want. We can move in. We can live the colonial dream. We can get a big piece of land and grow it and make a lot of money. How do you think they're going to feel about England after they had just been a part of this war. The colonists had fought in this war to get that land. And now England's saying, nope, you can't move there. Well, they're going to get mad because, you know, they don't have any ability to get new land. So colonists are mad that the decision was made by parliament and not colonial assemblies. So you have this whole problem. Hey, the over here in England, wherever it is over on the map, uh, the parliament who is in charge of England is making decisions for the colonies. 
and the colonies aren't getting to make those decisions for themselves. And remember, they had been able to do that because before England had left them alone. Okay, they'd left them alone, and now all of a sudden they're making decisions for them. All right, so this this goes to what I was just talking about. The French and Indian War brought an end to salutary neglect and began parliamentary sovereignty. So that sounds really complicated, but it's really easy. Okay. Up until this point, the colonies had been able to do whatever they wanted. England left them alone and said, we don't want to deal with them. Okay. After this point, England says, we need our money. We want to get paid back for our money. And so now they've got to pay us back. And so the only way we can get our money back is to control everything that they do and make them pay us our taxes. Okay. So after they had had all this freedom, they had had all of these you know, assemblies and, you know, the House of Burgesses in Virginia and all of these different lawmaking bodies in the colonies. After all of that time with that, now England's like, nope, those don't mean anything. We are supreme. We make the law and you have to follow it. That is not going to go down well with the colonists. Sorry about that, my phone rang. Parliamentary, parliament has a total rule, all right? It doesn't matter what they say um, over here in the colonies, parliament controls everything, all right? English officials assume that parliament must have ultimate authority over all laws and taxes. We want our money back. All right, the British began governing their colonies more strictly. And remember, salutary neglect. It's when your parents go, eh, we're just going to let you do whatever you want. You can stay up as late as you want. You can eat whatever you want. You can go where, you can go wherever you want with whoever you want at whatever time you want. And then all of a sudden they go, eh, you can't do any of that. We're going to take all of those things away. You know, how would you feel about that? Well, that's salutary neglect. The colonists had been free all this time. They'd been making their own laws. And all of a sudden England says, eh, no more. And that is not going to make them happy. All right, so... Um, new taxes and laws were passed without asking colonial assemblies. Uh, Brit as Britain assumed more control, the colonists tried to hang on to their power of their colonial assemblies, so obviously they're not happy, so they want to keep the power. The colonies do. This shift would prove to be the beginning of the long road towards colonial independence. So this is very important. Um, this lack of freedom is what is going to make these colonies want to rebel. They're going to say, we have an inalienable right, meaning we have a right that no one can take away. God gave it to us, and no one can take it away from us uh, to rule our own areas. And because England is refusing to give us the ability to do that, we will fight them. All right. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you know more about the French and Indian War. I know that's a lot of information, but uh, hopefully I told it in a way that allows you to understand it. All right. Until next time, catch you later.